I've always considered myself a devout Mega Man fan, but this brand loyalty really only extends as far as the original series. You know, the, the classic Mega Man games. Mega Man has spawned a number of spin-off series over the years, and I've always found these to be a bit hit or miss. None more so than the Mega Man X series. Now, in all fairness, I do credit the series for bestowing upon me what is easily one of my all-time favorite video games. But on the other hand, I also blame the series for producing some of my all-time least favorite games. In total, there were eight core games in the Mega Man X series, and outside of a handful of spin-off games, a remake on the PSP, and a number of reissues, the series has been, for all intents and purposes, effectively dead for nearly 20 years. However, the fact that it's still as well regarded today as it is, is a testament to the sheer goodwill earned by the first handful of games in the series, because it sure as hell wasn't any of these. Today, everyone still talks about how amazing the original X game was, and to a lesser extent, its immediate sequel. Even the seventh game has some level of notoriety, which is not to be confused with being remembered fondly. But no one ever really seems to talk about the eighth and final game in the series, which is why I'm here to say, hello, I'm Mr. Matthews, and today I'm going to be reviewing Mega Man X8. Subtitled Paradise Lost. This is X. I've encountered an accident while on patrol at the orbital elevator. Mega Man X8 opens with a rather inconsequential cutscene, which only exists as a means to introduce a new character named Lumine. Lumine is the architect of what is called the orbital elevator, which is a literal highway to space, and its purpose is to accelerate mankind's colonization of the moon. This is referred to as the Jacob Project. Lumine's shuttle malfunctions for some reason, and it falls off the space highway and crash lands back on Earth. Lumine explains that he and his companions are part of an advanced generation of Reploids that have the same copy ability as Axel, and they only survive the crash by assuming the form of Sigma, who apparently is the only body type strong enough to withstand the impact. Now quick side note here, for some reason this story dumps a lot of religious symbolism on you, but it's, it's really superficial and on the nose, and honestly it probably only exists to make the game seem smarter than it really is. Okay, yeah, we get it. The subtitle Paradise Lost is a reference to John Milton's poem of the same name, which basically tells the story of Lucifer after he had been cast out of heaven. In the original poem, Lucifer rallies together the support of his fellow fallen angels and forms a rebellion against heaven, which ultimately leads to that business with Adam and Eve and the apple. Thematically, I guess you could say that X8's plot follows a similar structure, but this has been the basic premise of the entire series from the beginning. The Jacob Project and Orbital Elevator are thinly veiled representations of Jacob's Ladder, the original Stairway to Heaven. Now in the character of Lumine, it, it's hard not to see the celestial theme that they're going with, so just a quick recap. What we have here is an angelic character who has essentially fallen from heaven and is now staring at X all creepy-like under his eyebrows with a backdrop of burning fire. So what, that, you think that means he's a bad guy? Why, why would you think he's a bad guy? He, he, he's not a bad guy. <clears throat> now from the outset, X8 establishes its intention to redeem the series from its past sins. All three main characters are playable right away. You alternate between X, Axel, and Zero several times during the introduction stage, and there's some nice banter between the characters as they tag each other out. These are much, much better voice actors than X7 had. Axel, pick up the pace. This is no time to slack off. You show up late and have the nerve to complain? Each character has their own unique movesets, and it's worth noting that the stage is laid out in such a way that you are encouraged to discover these on your own. So it's nice to see that the game respects the distinction of learning game mechanics through experience rather than obtrusive exposition. Of course, Capcom hasn't completely given up on the idea that you need a navigator to hold your hand throughout the game, so Alia is back once again to make sure that no child is left behind, and this time she's joined by two additional operators, Layer and Palette. And yes, they will still try to tell you how to play the game, but the point is, you could ignore them. It's also worth mentioning how empowered X, Zero, and Axel are right at the beginning of the game. The controls are quick, responsive, and satisfying, but it goes further than that. 
For possibly the first time in the series, none of the characters feel underpowered or like a, a fixer-upper. Quite the opposite, in fact. In addition to signature moves like Zero's double jump and Axel's ability to hover, all three characters can wall climb and air dash without any additional upgrades. Between these three characters, you have the ability right from the very beginning to access almost every secret item and area in the game. No key items are locked away behind any character-specific moves that you don't start the game with, except of course for the ones associated with the sub-weapons you collect by defeating boss characters. This should be a welcome change to anyone who has ever been frustrated in the other games by the various items and secrets that were held out of your reach until you acquired the appropriate armor upgrade for X. At the end of the stage, X and company are confronted by Vile, you know, from the Super Nintendo games. Vile! He used to be a Class A hunter, but now he's our sworn enemy. Yeah, he's back, and he's kidnapped Lumine. Which is not suspicious at all because Lumine is definitely, definitely not a bad guy. So just get that out of your head. So the motivating force behind the story is this urgency to rescue Lumine from Vile. And almost immediately, X starts in again with the old, Oh, why do we have to keep fighting? No! And then Axel cuts in. He's like, all right, that's enough. Everyone's sick of you crying all the time. No one's interested in your goddamn feelings. So pull on your big boy pants. Let's go handle this, okay? And then X is like, you know what? I will do that. Thank you. Goddamn drama queen, were we in high school again? Warning. Warning. I'm picking up a Maverick reading. Now from here, the game unfolds pretty much as you'd expect in the series. You could tackle the initial eight stages in any order you want, and once you choose a stage, you select which two characters you want to bring in. The partner system has been refined a bit from X7. There's actually some strategy to it now. For example, swapping between characters will allow the inactive character to slowly recover health points in the background. Tagging out your character will also break you out of certain traps and enemy holds. And your two characters can also team up to unleash a powerful double attack, which deals a massive amount of damage and is very effective against bosses. Anyone who was disappointed with how useless Zero was in the last game should be happy to hear that he has been completely rebalanced in X8. In fact, he is probably my favorite character to use. In addition to his double jump, his saber attacks are fast and have a good amount of range. So being limited to melee attacks does not feel like a disadvantage at all. You could also find additional melee weapons for him to use, like a spear, these, these fans, his fists, or a big ol' hammer. Axel has also been rebalanced, particularly in regards to how his copy ability works. The copy shot no longer needs to be charged up, and it seems to be just as powerful as his normal blaster shot, so you don't need to spend 5 minutes whittling down an enemy to get their DNA. Axel also does not automatically change forms when he picks up a DNA sample. It becomes selectable like any of your sub-weapons, and you can change in and out of it whenever you want. In fact, there's actually a small puzzle element to Axel's copy ability here, since where you pick up the enemy DNA is rarely where you're expected to actually use it. And the uses for this mechanic are a bit more clever than they were in X7, but unfortunately they are, are still not used nearly enough. Transform! After you select your playable characters, you then select which operator will act as your hint delivering system during the stage. Now, I haven't found that there's a lot of difference between the three of them, but each operator will focus on slightly different aspects of the stage. And I truly wish I could tell you that they aren't just as annoying here as Alia has been in the past few games, but they will still be constantly trying to talk to you during the game. X, can you hear me? Listen to me! Mercifully, there is a fourth option. You can now choose to play the game without a navigator, so now you can actually finally have some peace and quiet. Thank you, Capcom. I don't think I'm alone in saying that this is something this series has desperately needed since Mega Man X5. Now for me at least, the biggest draw of every Mega Man game is the eight initial robot bosses. And the Mavericks here in X8 are… they're, they're okay. It's somewhat telling I suppose that one of the strongest Maverick designs is a… is a chicken. There's also a praying mantis, an ant, an abominable snowman, a panda, a jellyfish, a trilobite, and a sunflower. I mean, I mean, sure, why not? So they definitely used up some of their better boss designs in the previous games. Before each fight begins, there's a little conversation between Hunter and Maverick, 
which changes slightly depending on which character you brought into the battle. Now that part is pretty much carried over wholesale from X7. The difference is that X8 actually uses professional grade voice actors, so even though the dialogue itself is as cringy as ever, it's at least competently delivered. What's going on here? This is no ordinary riot. This is revenge. Revenge for all the Repoids you labeled Maverick and threw onto this scrap heap. Mavericks bring only disaster and destruction. We have no choice but to stop them. This is what you mean when you speak of justice? It's you who should be scrapped. You know, he, he's got a point. The boss fights themselves are pretty fun and dynamic, which is truly appreciated after the lethargic and tedious slap fights from X7. None of these fights are especially difficult, especially if you utilize the partner system, but using the appropriate sub weapon is still extremely effective. So the rock, paper, scissors system that the Mega Man series has been built upon is still in full effect. Once you whittle the Maverick's health down far enough, they go invulnerable for a few moments and unleash some screen filling mega attacks. As you would expect, defeating each Maverick will also allow you to use their signature weapon as your own. Unfortunately, outside of the boss battles, you probably won't be doing that. There are a few secret items that are almost arbitrarily locked away behind some stage element that can only be destroyed by a specific weapon, but for the most part, there's not really much incentive to use any of the weapons for most of the game. Granted, that's partly because of how empowered X, Zero, and Axel are in this game, which is definitely a good thing. The character mobility and versatility is so strong that anything other than their base abilities usually feels like a step down. But more than that, there's, there's no denying that this is probably one of the weakest selections of sub-weapons in the entire series. Conversely, I'd say this is probably one of the best set of Maverick stages since Mega Man X4. There's some genuinely clever stage design here, like the gravity puzzles of Gravity Antonian stage or the multiple routes that you could take through Bamboo Pandemonium stage, some of which are only accessible if you're able to hang onto the ride armor. I also like Optic Sunflower stage, which is basically a series of time trials, where a better performance leads to greater rewards and a greater challenge. Dark Mantis' stage is an obvious callback to a stage from Mega Man X2, and it requires you to use a bit of stealth as you evade detection by dodging searchlights and tripwires. Now on the opposite end of the scale are the two speeder bike stages, which I've never been a fan of in any of the X games. Now to be fair, both of these are better than the loathsome bomb hunting racetrack from X7. But on the other hand, this stage and this boss in particular are just awful. And I wish that I could surgically remove them from this game and put them into X7 where they belong. Jesus Stupid. Outside of the speeder bike stages, this game is entirely side-scrolling, but it does use that 2.5D perspective, so every surface has visible depth, which sometimes makes it unnecessarily tricky to gauge where platforms end. Graphically, I can't say that this game is especially mind-blowing even by PlayStation 2 standards. I mean, look at it, you can see what it looks like. It's nice enough, I suppose, but I don't think there's anyone who's going to say that this world is more attractive and intuitive to move around than this one. X8 soundtrack is pretty impressive though. The Mega Man X series has always been known for having rockin' soundtracks, but this actually sounds like they got live musicians in to record a lot of the music. That, that's pretty cool. As you progress through the game, you'll probably notice that you've been collecting a lot of these inverted triangles. The game calls these medals, and they're the game's currency for purchasing character upgrades and extra items like subtanks. Now, I really like this upgrade system, but it, it does mean you'll be doing a bit of resource farming to be able to afford some of the more expensive upgrades for each character. This currency system doesn't completely remove the need to explore every nook and cranny of every stage. There are still plenty of secrets to uncover. There are still eight Dr. Light capsules to find, but this time there's only a single neutral armor that you're given immediately. What you're actually collecting are the various pieces of two upgrade systems for the armor. What I really like about this is that you can use each upgrade immediately. You don't need to complete the whole set like some of the other games made you do. What's even better is that you can mix and match these components, allowing you to truly customize X's special moveset. But only by combining all four matching pieces can you access the full potential for each system. Got this 
one. Huh? I'm picking up a transmission. Sigma. Long time no see, X. Don't worry, X. It'll all be over soon and we'll never have to meet again. Once you complete the Maverick stages, there's not really a whole lot of game left. You ride into space on the orbital elevator, and at the top, Vile is waiting for you with the full boss fight. Then there's the obligatory boss rush sequence where you fight the eight Mavericks all over again. What's new this time is that all the transporters are color-coded, so you can kind of anticipate which Maverick is coming up. Now this is a very minor detail, but none of the other games in this series have offered any explanation for why you're fighting all of the Mavericks for a second time. But each of these Mavericks is revealed to be an advanced Reploid in disguise. This may be insignificant, but I appreciate that X8 actually attempts to give this sequence some context within the story. The refight sequence concludes with a battle against Sigma, who also turns out to be a copy. Wait, wasn't there another character in this game with a copy ability? Oh, that's right, it was Axel. You know, as much as I hated him in X7, he's actually alright in this game. And at last, you come to the final stage, Sigma's Palace, which is crawling with an army of copy Sigmas. This stage is actually a bit of a slog, and not only because it is bristling with spikes. See, this entire palace is essentially a single room, but it's divided into a handful of sections that the game actually needs to scroll between. This is an issue because enemies can still attack between sections, and there's usually a bed of spikes or a pit right at the entrance to each section, which is kind of a dick move. Welcome, Maverick Hunter. It's good to see you again, X. And I really don't understand Sigma's look here. Uh, a cyber demon, I guess? I've been playing a lot of Doom. Oh, I get it. He's the devil. You know, because of the symbolism. Now, X, you will be destroyed along with the rest of this decayed world. Wait, so you're planning on leaving Earth and you're never coming back. So, how does that spell Doom for humanity again? Bring it on! Now this Sigma battle isn't too difficult, but if you've played any of the other X games, you know this is just the first phase of a three-part battle. All right, so you might want to sit down for this next part. You ready? Lumine was actually a bad guy all along. Oh, are you not impressed by that reveal? Was that not shocking? Well, how about this? Lumine actually is the final boss. After eight games in the series, Capcom appears to be killing off its primary antagonist for good. This is a positive change, by the way. Don't get me wrong, Sigma was a good villain. Kind of a megalomaniac with ideals. I guess basically a cross between Thanos and, I don't know, Skeletor. And this was fine. You know, the first couple times. But fighting Sigma at the end of every X game became as rote and obligatory as fighting heart tanks and Dr. Light capsules. It stopped actually meaning anything. It was just one more thing to do to complete the game. Conversely, the final battle against Lumine feels like it actually has some weight to it. Lumine has been the central plot device for this entire game, and as a result, there's a connection to the main characters, particularly X and Axel which is something the Sigma battles had been missing for most of the series. Lumine is a great villain because he's almost the exact opposite of Sigma. Representing Sigma as a demon and Lumine as an angel might be a little on the nose, but the symbolism is still pretty effective. Lumine isn't a hulking warmonger like Sigma. He's a polite and beautiful sociopath. He doesn't care about X, Zero, or Axel, who he sees as beneath them. All he seems to care about is the eradication of any being who isn't as perfect as he is. As his health dwindles at the end of the second phase of this battle, Lumine becomes the literal angel of death. You have about 30 seconds to win, or he will straight up insta-kill you no matter how much health you have. break through his shields and finish him off with a satisfying double attack. Here we go! Ah! 
After the fight is over, Axel gets too close. Luminate comes back to life and does a, a thing. And Axel dies. Except he doesn't. He he's fine. Axel is taken damage, but he's fine. Yeah, they probably could have let that moment breathe a little bit. Mega Man X8 isn't necessarily over after you beat the game. Just like X7, there is a New Game Plus mode that opens up after beating the game for the first time, and it's here that some extra content becomes available. For X, it's the Ultimate Armor, which is basically a combination of the two previous armors, and it has a devastating special attack that will wipe all but the sturdiest of health gauges down to a single bar with one hit. Sigma's hilariously oversized sword becomes available for purchase as a new melee weapon for Zero. Alternate armors for Zero and Axel also become selectable at the character select screen, although these are shrouded in mystery. Seriously, why can't they just tell you what these things actually do? They seem to allow you to dash further, and I'm assuming that they also boost the effectiveness of your defense and special weapons. Now, I touched on this earlier, but it bears repeating that there is a lot, and I mean a lot, of resource farming in this game. In order to unlock the bonus armors, you have to purchase all of the available upgrades for each of the three characters, which you will not be able to afford without an extensive amount of metal grinding. Now the game actually throws you a few bones here. There's a chip you can buy that will discount all the items in the shop, and another one that will let you just generate metals by moving around. There's also intermission versions of most of the Maverick stages, seemingly for the express purpose of gathering metals. But even still, the road to fully upgrading all three characters is expensive, time-consuming, and honestly not very exciting, even if you have a high tolerance for resource grinding. Now remember what I said earlier about being able to turn off the navigators? Now hopefully you didn't listen to me, because depending on how often you use them, they become available as playable characters in the second playthrough. For a small fee, Alia Lair and Palette are basically reskins of X, Zero, and Axel, and unlocking them costs 40,000 medals each, or 36,000 with the discount. And of course, each navigator has the same set of upgrades as her Maverick Hunter counterpart. I did mention all the grinding in this game, right? To be clear, the operators are complete reskins of X, Zero, and Axel. They are still bound to the logic of the story, so Alia doesn't get X's armor upgrades, and Pellet doesn't have Axel's copy ability. This changes up their gameplay just enough that they don't feel like one-to-one -one clones of the original characters. And let's be honest, the designs aren't totally without appeal. For me personally, being able to play through the game as the Navigators was a perfectly acceptable reward for the extra time spent grinding medals, even if they don't really change the game in any way. I'm not going to pretend that my opinions and perception of the X series in any way reflects popular opinion. I mean, they should, I'm, I'm being pretty sensible here, I think. But I think for the most part, we're all in agreement that interest in the series dropped off right around here. And as a result, X8 really didn't get the recognition that I think it probably deserved. If this is the case for you, I, I strongly suggest you give this game a shot. No, it, it's not as good as these games, and objectively, probably not even as good as these. But it gets bonus points from me for not being a blatant carbon copy of a previous game as these games were. And it's one of the only sequels in the series that feels like it actually changes the formula with intent, with deliberate consideration for how these changes actually improve the game, not just make it different. In other words, it does exactly what a good sequel should do. It repeats what worked in the previous games, and it fixes or removes what didn't. Now regarding a hypothetical sequel to Mega Man X, I'd, I'd like to see it as long as it's a sequel to this game. I'd like to see a sequel completely without Sigma, with more gameplay that complemented Axel's unique mechanics, perhaps even three separate storylines, similar to Mega Man X4. But I honestly don't have any faith that we'd see a sequel like that, in which case, I'd rather we didn't get one at all. It seems like Capcom understood that this would likely be their final game in the series, 
and they tried to make it the best game they could, perhaps even as an apology for the previous two or three games. So even if the Mega Man X series is gone forever, at least Capcom sent it off on a high note. I'm Mr. Matthews. Goodbye.